Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to the broadcast today. Thank you for joining in with us. It's beautiful outside, and I trust that it's beautiful inside wherever you are. It's a wonderful day to welcome you to the broadcast today and to share with you the Word of God. We're going to be uh, in the book of Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, and again, I'm glad you have tuned in to share the Word of God with us today. I'm excited about this Word today, seeking assurance, and I just heard uh, my youngest sister, Reverend Fagel Grant, preach about having assurance last night. Our assurance is in Jesus Christ. I've known a lot of people who thought that they could be assured of something because of an individual or person, but listen, our assurance is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He changes not. He's not going to be absent when you need him, and he's certainly not going to be out of place at any time. And so stay right where you are as we get ready and get into the Word of God today. Today's broadcast uh, goes out in memory of Miss uh, Mrs. Dolly Smith, and certainly uh, our prayers for her husband and for her family uh, gone on to be with the Lord at uh, the young age of about 62 or 62 and a half, and certainly uh, I have fun memories of her and uh, from Wetumpka, Alabama. Our prayers for them and for the Eves family over there in that metropolis, uh, and I'm being a little facetious there, of Wetumpka, Alabama, my schoolmates who are gone on now to be with the Lord our God. And so, uh, prayers for them and for uh, their families there. All right, we are going to pray and get right into the Word of God. Uh, Father, thank you for the Word today, even as we thank you for the beautiful sunlight that's piercing these stained glass windows behind me and that adorns the earth. We praise you because every good and perfect gift comes from you and Whatever you do, it's always good, it's always right, it's always holy. So we thank you that what you do uh, is not questionable by us. Uh, it cannot be scrutinized nor judged by us. And we can only make fools of ourselves uh, by questioning the work of the Almighty God. I pray that you help us not to blame you for that which you're not doing. Uh, so that uh, there won't be further confusion when we are in a place uh, of ambiguity or a place where we lack knowledge or understanding. Help us to simply say, Lord, I trust you, and Lord, I'm moving on in faith in your name. Give us assurance, uh, even as you've spoken it in the word. We are never left alone because you're with us always. We're never separated from your love because nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And help us to walk in that kind of assurance, whether we're facing darkness, whether we're facing uh, other adversities, death, disappointment, divorce, devastation, whatever it is, help us to be assured you're the God who walks with us in the storm and the rain as well as in the sunshine, in Jesus' name. Give us your revelation, give us your insight into your word today. Humility of head, humility of heart, so that we would become practitioners of this faith in Jesus Christ. I give you thanks. Amen. All right, then, let's get into Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. And I'm going to read that particular uh, passage that you're hearing. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. 
And to the one who does not work, listen now, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the godly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Listen to what he says. Here's the quote. Uh, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Verse 9. Is this blessing then only one for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was after. But before he was circumcised, he received the sign of, uh, he received, verse 11, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, which he was still, when he was still uncircumcised. All right. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that the righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Now, some of you, I hear you saying, well, what does circumcision uh, and uncircumcision have to do with faith? Remember, the background of our lesson takes us all the way back uh, to Abraham. And God calling him away, and, and he become the man of faith. And later God commanded Abraham to be circumcised and to circumcise his son and his whole household, okay? And so circumcision became the uh, sign of the covenant that God instituted with the Hebrews or Israelites or the Jews, as they became known, uh, through Abraham. And so uh, people always take, some, some people always take what God means for one thing and they try and make it something else and then it becomes uh, an evil or a snare. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to look at uh, this assurance thing because our subject, I didn't give you that, did I? Seeking assurance. Seeking assurance. Um, I, I mentioned my younger sister, Reverend Fagel Grant, who preached last night uh, from Romans chapter 8. We're more than conquerors. And then, of course, the end of Romans 8 is what can separate us from the love of God. And, and Apostle Paul declared absolutely nothing. Death can't, life can't, principalities, powers, uh, rulers, darkness, nothing, nothing in the height, death. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Now, there are still people seeking assurance uh, for their salvation. Now, remember, Apostle Paul's not given credit as being the founder of the church in Rome. Hadn't been, and talks about going, uh, even in his writings. However, he imparted great doctrine into the Christian church period, whether it was Rome or whether it was in other places. And that's one of the assignments uh, you'll see in the Bible of Apostles. They establish doctrine and what we're supposed to believe. So you can't just go out yonder and decide. Uh, you're just going to create something and call it a church and do whatever you want to do. doesn't work that way. We have the, the Bible, and in particular, the New Testament, the Gospels, and the epistle writers to help us understand what we're supposed to believe. Now, I'm going to come back to that a little bit later because I'm going to point to two doctrinal tenets of the AME Zion Church, which uh, are consistent in most churches around the world, all right? Now, let's look at, uh, let me also say that while Apostle Paul was trying to help uh, the Gentile church be assured 
of its place and its salvation, he also had to correct the Jewish church who sometimes uh, became skewed in their understanding and who are uh, sometimes veered off from the, the, the sound doctrine of being justified and saved by faith. And they wanted to bring circumcision in and, and make that a requirement for people who were being saved when in fact God never said you had to be circumcised in the New Testament to be saved. That came out of the Old Testament. And remember, it was for the Jews uh, after the order and command of Abraham uh, that Abraham received from God and then Abraham carried it out. So, Reverend Mr. John Wesley is given credit for being the founder of the Methodist movement period, okay? We're talking 1700s, uh, the early 1700s, about 1739, eight to 10 people reportedly came to Mr. Reverend Mr. John Wesley seeking salvation. And so he started classes, and after the classes, the classes grew, so they started a society which is the same or synonymous with church. Later, Mr. Wesley came to America, preached to the Indians, had some frustrations uh, in the early going, went back, and then he heard uh, the preacher uh, uh, actually reading, as it is said, the preface, the preface to the book of Romans, to the epistle or the letter of Romans. And in hearing him read, listen, not the actual scripture of Romans, but to just be reading the preface. And this is why being in church can be so powerful. You don't ever know when the Holy Spirit is going to move and talk to people or work a miracle. He's listening to the preface. And I think it was Peter Bowler reading. I can't really remember, but I think it was Peter Bowler reading the preference to the book of Romans, and Miss Reverend Mr. John Wesley said, when he heard him reading the preface, he felt his heart strangely warmed by the Holy Spirit, and he knew he was saved, and he had an assurance of his salvation. Came back to America and set America on fire. And so now you've got, uh, I'm African Methodist Episcopal Zion, uh, that's the African Methodist Episcopal, that's the Christian Methodist Episcopal, that's the United Methodist, that's the Independent Methodist, uh, that's the Wesleyan Church, uh, that's the Church of the Nazarene, and, I, and there are others, and all of us have our roots from Methodism uh, that John Wesley taught uh, through his experiences and getting saved and having assurance. Isn't that awesome? Uh, and so... Uh, the Lord gives us assurance at different times for our salvation. Now, one thing I knew for sure when I was saved, I was saved. I was converted. But I, I needed assurance about this call to preach, even though I believe with all my heart I was called. You know, at 19, couldn't be too sure of anything. And so I asked uh, an old veteran preacher, and I don't know why this was the man I asked, but it was the right one, uh, uh, the late Reverend J.J. Cottrell. And he said to me, if you want assurance, son, he told me how to pray. He told me what to ask God. Simple thing, that God did everything that old man told me to pray and ask for. Everything I prayed and asked for, God showed it to me. And I had great assurance that I was not only saved, but I was called to preach this gospel. And here I am 42 and a half years later. Now, today we're going to talk about the assurance of being saved, justified, forgiven. And actually, those can be synonymous because they happen at the same time. When you are saved, you are forgiven of your sins and you are justified or made right in the sight of God. Now, there's, there are some people who believe in a justification by works. Now, this has a lot of people confused. They believe uh, there's a work. So the lesson today, let me walk through some of the things in the lesson today. Abraham believed God first, the lesson said, 
and then he's circumcised later on. Now, he wasn't circumcised when God called him to leave his father's home and his kindred and to go to a land that God would show him. He wasn't circumcised then. But the man believed God, so he left his father's house and he went to see a land and discover a land that God and possess the land that God promised him. First justification. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him, the Bible says, as righteousness. The man hadn't been circumcised. He was a person of faith. Now, you say there are always people trying to attach some form of work uh, to justification. No, either Jesus died to save me for the Almighty God, or he didn't. Jesus did the work. You can't work to be justified. You cannot work to be saved. Stay with me. Look at this passage. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. If we are made righteous by works, then salvation is not a gift. Now, we, we teach and teach it very boldly and adamantly according to the word of God. Salvation is the gift of God. Let's prove it. John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Jesus shall not perish, but have everlasting life. All right? He gave us his Son. That is a gift. All right? That's a gift. I'm wearing two rings today. I'm wearing my wedding ring, and I'm wearing uh, a class ring that represents Wetumpka High, Huntington College, and Emory University, the places I've graduated from with degrees. Now, my wedded ring, as you would suspect, uh, Reverend Mrs. Shuford gave me a wedding ring, all right? Uh, the class ring, however, which denotes uh, my, my schools, Mrs. Shuford didn't give me that one. That wasn't a gift from somebody. That was something I purchased for myself. The difference is a gift is what someone gives you. I worked to earn money for my other ring, and thus I bought it. And so God gave us Jesus Christ. You didn't work for him. You did not deserve him. You didn't pay one cent. God gave us Jesus, and because he gave us Jesus, we are saved if we believe in him. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 8 through 10 is one of my favorite passages when it comes to salvation. You are saved by grace through faith, not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works, because people would boast. And so I'm going to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses, uh, what did I say? 8 through 10. I like this. I, I've loved this passage a lot of years. I mean, probably 30 plus years. I've loved this passage. Listen, now, I want to read it to you word for word. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift. Of God. Salvation is a gift. Not by works. This is verse 9. Not by works so that no one can boast. You can't brag about, I paid my tithes. I've been in church all my life. I was baptized as a baby. I've been faithful in the church. I'm going to, none of that entitles you to heaven. Now, don't quit paying your tithes, don't quit going to church, don't quit serving, but none of that entitles you to go to heaven. Listen to what he says, verse 9. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Listen, 
I've been saved longer than and serving the Lord, preaching too. For as I know, I've been preaching longer than, and I stated my conversion publicly, longer than all of my siblings. Now, I think all of us grew up believing in Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to say I was saved longer than them, but publicly I made my confession, and I began preaching before all of my siblings. There were 11 born to my mom and dad. I'm number nine of the 11. But listen to this. And here's the point I'm making. Don't miss this. I can't brag or boast about being saved or preaching longer than them because that doesn't entitle me to get to heaven. I can't brag about any work that I have done that entitles me to salvation. For we are saved by grace. That's the unmerited favor of God. The goodness of God that you don't deserve. We are saved by grace through faith. I feel a sermon coming on today. I better, let me see if I can stick with the teaching part. Verse 10 says, for we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God prepared in advance for us. You saved by grace. If you are saved, you're not saved because you look good, because you've done well, because you've been faithful, you did everything you thought you were supposed to do. You are saved by grace through faith. It's not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not by works because you would boast about it. All right? There's another great passage I like, uh, two more that I want to share with you. I'm just going to quote them because I've got to move on quickly now. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. And I've been saying this since I was in my 20s. Jesus says in that verse, Revelation 3, 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my, opens the door, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him or her, and he or she with me. Wow. Jesus says, I'm knocking at your door. And if you let me in, I'm coming in, saving you, fellowshipping with you, making you righteous in the sight of God, justifying you from all of the sins that you have committed. You say, that's just unbelievable. unbelievable. That's incredulous. Well, you got to decide in life what you're going to believe and what you are not going to believe. I choose to believe the word of the Lord. There's, there's a, a song that we were singing in the 90s uh, a lot. Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. That's what Isaiah chapter 53 declares. Uh, whose report Will you believe? And, and Isaiah goes on, the prophet, to talk about Jesus growing up as a uh, tender plant, as a root out of dry ground with no uh, form of no form of comeliness, no desire of beauty, that we should desire him. And he goes on, you know, to talk about Jesus prophetically 700 plus years before Jesus was born. And so even then, Isaiah asks, whose report Will you believe? I say like that songwriter said in the 90s, we shall believe the report of the Lord. His report says I am saved. His report says I'm filled. His report says I am free. Do you have the assurance? I have assurance because I've got his report. And people are always saying condemning things. And people are always going to tell lies. And people are always going to try and scandalize you. Do you have assurance? I believe the word of God and I have assurance by the Holy Spirit that God has saved me, justified me, made me right with God, thus forgiven. Now, for everybody that believes there has to be some work involved, there's a passage for you that I've got to read to you. It's in Romans chapter 6, 
and verse 23. Let me turn there very quickly. Uh, my, my good friend, Bishop George Crenshaw, said to me recently, he said, I noticed on the, on the uh, Facebook, you still uh, believe in the Bible because you're reading from the Bible. <laughs> and he was teasing with me. said, that's a good thing. We, you, we don't have any other source. This, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, is the sword of the Spirit. You want to fight? Fight with the Word of God. This is the sword of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost uses the Word to do His work. Now, what did I say? I'm going to read uh, Romans 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's a good word there. The wages of sin is death. The payment that you would get for all of your sins is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. God has given us the gift of salvation. Just bask in that a little bit. Quit condemning your own self. Quit bringing up your own past. Quit allowing other folks to try and condemn you. Quit focusing on the negativity that people are saying about you and accept the gift of God that's in Christ Jesus. Ooh, it blesses me to know that Jesus loves me. I think the greatest song that I have ever sung in my life, we learned it as a kid. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him below. They are weak, but he is strong. I don't think I've learned a better song than that song in all of my life. Yes, Jesus loved you. Do you have the assurance? He gave Jesus as a gift. That's to John 3, 16, because he loved us. He loves us. He loves us so much that he would give his only begotten son. That's a powerful dynamic. So, let me go to something else. I'm trying to help you just have complete assurance, and I'm trying to give you uh, evidence through the scripture, uh, through other books, uh, that you can have assurance uh, in Jesus Christ. You can have the assurance of your salvation, of your justification, of you being forgiven of all of your sins. Let me read something else to you. It's from the AME Zion Church Book of Discipline. Now hold on. This is based on Romans 3.20, Ephesians 2.8 that I just read to you. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. This is based on Romans 3.28 and Romans 5.1 and Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. And the book of discipline on page 14, 2016 edition of the AME Zion Church. This is uh, no, article number 9. I taught uh, in the ministerial courses of studies what we call... Uh, the articles of religion. And so these are our faith tenets. We believe this. This is what the Bible teaches us. This is article number nine. It's entitled of the justification of man or of humankind to be inclusive. We are accounted righteous before God only for the merit for our Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ. By faith and not by our works or worth. Wherefore, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and, a very, and is very full of comfort. So we're justified by our faith in Christ. That gives us assurance. And that's based upon Romans 3.28, Romans 5.1, Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. Isn't that awesome? Now, I went a step further because while we're justified by faith, because we're justified by faith, we then participate in doing good works. So listen to the second part of this. Article number 10. 
All right? Article number 10, page 14 in the A.M.E. Zion Book of Discipline. Although good works, which are the fruits of faith and follow after justification, cannot put away our sins and endure the severity of God's judgment, yet they are pleasing and acceptable to God in Christ and spring out of a true and lively faith in so much that by them a lively faith may be as evidently known as a tree is discerned by its fruit. Now what were they saying in our book of discipline? They were saying we are saved by grace through faith. Then they were saying uh, good works spring forth as a result of having a lively faith in Jesus Christ. So since I'm saved by grace through faith, I believe in doing the works of the kingdom out of my faith in Christ because Christ was full of good works. So when you're full of good works, whether you're healing the sick, raising the dead, feeding the hungry, helping the battered, their bruised, uh, the setting their breasts free or the captives, uh, or whether you are given uh, money or given resources, using your spiritual gifts and talents and abilities, whatever you're doing good in Christ is acceptable unto him. And out of your lively faith in Jesus Christ, we serve. That's why I get tired serving in the church. Somebody say, well, you get you work because they pay you a salary. Well, praise the Lord, Mount Zion pays me a salary. I got paid a salary as a meat cutter. I got paid a salary as an insurance salesman. I was paid a salary in everything I've ever done when I was employed. But my good works come as a result of my faith in Christ. Hello. When I graduated from high school, I didn't know what I was going to do in life. I had all these ideas. I thought I might have wanted to be a doctor. I'm glad I didn't go that route because I wouldn't like that. Uh, after knowing all that I know about hospitals and sicknesses and diseases and experiencing that for 42 years, I didn't want to do that. I'm so thankful for good, good doctors uh, that I do trust. Uh, and couldn't wait, as I told my family members, to get my vaccine in that left arm. And, and you know, I was excited about that. Couldn't wait to get it. Cause I, and one of my best friends for life uh, is an MD. So, you know, I've got great doctor friends. But I couldn't, I'm glad I didn't want to be a doctor. I thought I might want to be uh, a mathematician. I'm glad I wouldn't want to do that. I hate to look at numbers all day. That wasn't going to work. And the Lord knew all of this. Uh, and, and I thought I might have wanted to be uh, an attorney, and I, that might be something I might have wanted to be uh, still to this day. I think I could have done that, uh, but I'm not sure about that, okay? And the Lord just intervened and said, you're going to be my preacher, and you're going to pastor people, and you're going to impart the eternal word of God, and you're going to help people be assured that they are saved, and you're going to help people understand that they are supposed to do good works because good works spring forth out of a lively faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm so excited that God uh, decided what I would be able to do because he knew I didn't know what to do. All right. The lesson goes on to say this, our Sunday down lesson for today, the study. He goes on to tell us that David sinned and then David repented and God forgave him. All right. That, that's Second Samuel chapter 11 and 12. And forgiveness is God's gift. What did David do that made him deserve to be forgiven by God after he had committed adultery, after he had killed the woman, had the woman's husband put on the front line, Uriah the Hittite, man of color, hallelujah. What, what did David deserve to be forgiven? By the way, David was a man of color too because his great Great-grandmama was Rahab the Canaanite. I just thought I'd throw that in. It came to my mind. Uh, he was a man of color too. All right. And so what, what did David do after he committed adultery and then set this man's husband up to be killed? What, what did he do? What, I mean, he didn't do anything. He repented. 
No good work could he do. He repented and God forgave him and saved him and protected him. Yeah, even though he had to go through some stuff, nobody could put their hands on David. That's my favorite character. I know, I know, I know his son Ammon raped his half-sister Tamar. I know about that, David's children. I know about his son Absalom killed his half-brother Ammon, David's two sons. I know about that. I know about Absalom later rebelled against his dad. I know about King Saul trying to kill David seven times. I know about the schemes and the plots. But when David repented that day, after Nathan the prophet rebuked him and told him, you are the man, David repented. Psalms 51 records this great prayer. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your love and kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Purge me from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Ooh, I, I don't have time to read it. I better I bet not even turn to it. You know that. And he goes on to tell God, create in me a clean heart and renew within me a right spirit. Make the bones that you have broken rejoice. And whatever you do, don't take your spirit from me. David repented. And God forgave him and then protected him and blessed David all the days of his life. Wherever he went, God gave him victory. <laughs> Whomever it was that came up against him, they failed because God forgave him. What did David do for God to forgive him like that? And the answer is, he didn't do any good work for God to forgive him. Forgiveness is God's gift, like salvation. Let me go to the next thing. So then, their lesson argues, circumcision is a sign. It happened after Abraham had believed. All right? So let's look at four, four dynamics of Abraham, and I'm, I'm uh, coming quickly uh, to the end. I want to spend some time praying today. Look at this. Abraham is considered the father of the faith. All right? Why is that? In Genesis 12, God told Abraham, leave your father's house. Let me turn to Genesis chapter 12, since it's not actually printed in the lesson, and some of you perhaps are writing, and I want to read it uh, just as it is rather than quote portions of it, all right? In Genesis chapter 12, God, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. All, and all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. Wow. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. And I'll stop right there. By faith, Abraham left his family to go to a land that God was going to show him. And as a result, he was blessed. We used to say it like this. He got his socks blessed off of him. He was blessed so, so much Everybody who would come up against Abraham to curse him, they got cursed. Everybody come up to bless Abraham, they, were, they got blessed. In chapter 17 then, it's the covenant of the circumcision. Now notice there are five chapters between Abraham being told to leave home and Abraham being circumcised. And so the dynamicness here is you've got God telling him to move in faith. And then later, God tells him what, what I'm going to read to you now. Verse 15, uh, Genesis 17. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. You know, God changed Abraham's name uh, to Abraham. His name was Abram. And then God made him Abraham, the father of the nation. Verse 16. Now he says he's changing Sarai's name to Sarah. Uh, verse 16. 
I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Okay, so now God says in chapter 17, I'll come back to uh, the circumcision. He says to him, I'm going to bless you with a son. Wow, this is heavy stuff. Then, at verse 24 says, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised. So God now instituted the circumcision. Man was 99. God had already made a covenant with him. Abraham had already responded in righteousness. He had already left his homeland. God had already changed his name. God had already promised to give him a son in his old age. And God said, I'm establishing my covenant. Verse number 19. Uh, he says, I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Talking about Isaac. And then God says, he circumcised Abraham. Had him be circumcised. Man was 99. What about all these years he'd been following the Lord? This is only to illustrate to us, we have the assurance of God's salvation as a gift of God, not as an act of works. Mm. A man said to me once that I needed to be baptized under the water. He said, have you been under the water yet? I said, no, I've been sprinkled. He said, well, you need to go under the water. If going under the water is a requirement for salvation, what did Jesus do for me? Hallelujah. If going on the water is a requirement for salvation, what did Jesus do for me? Did he die for me or did he die for me and I got to go under the water to be saved? Mm-hmm. The Bible says whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't say whosoever believeth in him and goes under the water. And all over the New Testament, with the exception of one passage that talks about uh, people believing and being baptized shall be saved. No. Baptism is like circumcision. It is the sign of the covenant. And, of course, the ancient Jewish church had three modes of baptism. They believed in sprinkling. They believed in pouring. They believed in immersion, that is, uh, submerging people completely in the water. We call it immersion, okay, with an I, immersion. But that's not a prerequisite for salvation. That's only a sign that we have believed in Jesus. And if it's not a sign that we have believed in Jesus, if it's a requirement to be saved, you just added a work of human beings to the blood that Jesus shed from Calvary's cross. And I declare unto you, there is nothing you can add to the shed blood of Jesus for salvation. You can have whichever mode you want. It's not water that saves, it's faith that saves. It's not circumcision that saves. It's faith that saves. It's not receiving Holy Communion that saves. It's faith that saves. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish. It is not your denomination or your church, local church, or non-denominational church that saves. It's faith that saves. Believing in Jesus Christ entitles you to salvation, to justification, to forgiveness, to heaven. Hallelujah. The thief on the cross didn't get baptized, but he went to paradise. What are you going to do with that? Say, well, he couldn't be baptized. He was dying on the cross. Man, woman, please. Jesus could have made it rain to baptize him if his baptism was a requirement. He could have, Jesus could have baptized him. He could have immersed that man in water right there on the cross. No, the point of the matter is works are not a requirement for salvation. 
we've got to get this right as Christians. Whatever work you're doing, you're doing that because you have been saved, I trust, and you believe in Jesus and the word. That's one more passage that I, I have that I wanted to share. Uh, so the circumcision, Abraham circumcised at, at 99. Then chapter 22 is in Genesis. It's a passage where God uh, said to Abraham, uh, go up and sacrifice Isaac. And he believed God so much that whatever God would say to Abraham, Abraham would do it. Took his only son Isaac, only son by Sarah, up on Mount Moriah. That's why you got all these churches named Moriah. Took his only son Isaac up on Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. And God provided a ram for him to sacrifice. And if you'll notice, there are great points of faith uh, as in Genesis 22. First point of faith, God told him, take your only son Isaac, go up and sacrifice. First point of faith. When he went up to sacrifice him, uh, his son said to him, get ready to go up the mountain, said, I see the wood and the fire. I don't see the lamb or the ram. In Abraham's point of faith, too, he says to him, the Lord will provide the sacrifice. Wow, that's great faith. And then there's a third point of faith before he gets up there to sacrifice. He said to uh, his servants, Abraham said to his servants, stay here while my son and I go and worship, and then we're coming back. That's what faith does. Faith believes without seeing. It is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It is confident assurance. That's what faith is. Confident assurance. I am confident that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. I'm confident that I'm already saved because I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my last passage for today. And so uh, there are persons seeking assurance. I want to say to any of you, if you're seeking assurance of salvation, believe the word of God. And the Holy Spirit will come and he will give you assurance. I didn't need a college professor to tell me that. I didn't need the late Reverend J.J. Cottrell to tell me I was saved. I needed him to help me understand what it meant to be a preacher and how to be assured of this calling to preach. And I got that. But I've never doubted my salvation. I'm assured Jesus died for me. I have believed in him. I've studied other religions. I believed in Jesus. And I am convinced he is the only way for anyone to be saved. My friends, my brothers, my sisters, my fellow creatures here in the earth, if you want assurance, the Lord will give it to you. Let's pray today. Let's pray. Some of us need assurance for salvation. Some of us need assurance about the calling in our lives, like the calling to preach. Before I accepted the call to preach, uh, there were Sunday school teachers, the late Mrs. Aurelia Crenshaw Berry, uh, my cousin, the late Mrs. Elizabeth Roberts, the late Mrs. Cazabel Cook King. They told me, you're going to be a preacher. And I marvel at that to this day, that those we, I call them old women. I thought they were old back then, but they some of them weren't even my age when they were telling me this. But they said that to me. And I said, you've got to be kidding. I'm not going to be a preacher. I didn't say that to them, not out loud. You know, that was a different era. I just said it to myself inside. you got to be kidding. I, I'm not going to do that. I said, that's what you all think. But they had faith. They had faith that God had called me to this ministry, and they saw it. Is that awesome? That's awesome to me. Common people, two of them were school teachers. One of them was just a common laborer, a farmer. How I love them to this day. Their faith has helped me 
these 42 years of my ministry. I have confident assurance that Jesus has died to save me and I am saved. Confident assurance that Jesus called me into this ministry. Confident assurance that he wants to give you assurance of your salvation and of your ministry. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you today. I thank you so much for the assurance you've given me for the countless times that you have spoken to me, whether I was preparing sermons or studies or whether I was praying or doing something else. Thank you for assurance. Thank you for quietly talking to me, even as you spoke yesterday about something that I needed to do. I give you praise that this assurance is available for every child of God. And so for every child of God that's listening to me right now, I'm praying for their assurance. I'm praying that you give them assurance of salvation, justification of their forgiveness, and that you give them a joy, an unspeakable joy, to serve you and to witness and to do everything they can, to get tired serving in the kingdom and be glad that they can get tired for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon your children listening to me on all of these outlets, O oh God. Quicken their mortal bodies. Be the celestial fire that burns inside of them. And be the Spirit of God in them. In the name of Jesus, producing, empowering, giving them power, activating, giving their spiritual gifts, activating their gifts, and giving them joy as they exercise. I give you thanks right now for every person that's on the call, that's on the outlet today, that he or she will have confident assurance in their salvation, in their calling, in their ministry, in the fact that you, O oh God, are with them always. They will never feel alone. They'll know that you are always with them in the storm and the rain, in pain, in sickness, in death, in confusion, in adversities of all sorts, they will know you're always with them. Give them the assurance, even greater assurance than you've given me to know that you never leave your children. In Jesus' name, I praise you, I bless you, I worship you, Lord Jesus, you alone. Hallelujah. I bless you, Lord Jesus, you alone. I bow only to you, Lord Jesus, for you, have all, you alone have conquered. You only are worthy of my praise, of my adoration, of my worship. You died for us. We can never pay you. But we pledge again our lives, our worship, our service, our resources for your kingdom. And I say to you again this day, O oh Lord, we do it gladly because you mean that much to us. Hallelujah. Have your way, O oh God. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way, Heavenly Father. We are your children. We are your vessels, your disciples, your ambassadors. We are your ministers of reconciliation. We are your ministers of the covenant, your servants. And we are that gladly in Jesus' name. We pray for our nation that's still in turmoil and some confusion, some deception, we pray against the lies, O oh God, that permeate the airways, 
We pray against those who would make cunning and deceptive attempts to strip people of voting rights or to make it difficult. We pray against those who would be unkind to immigrants. We pray against those who foster racism. Pray for their salvation. Pray for you to open their eyes. Pray for you to thwart all of their efforts. Bring, make their efforts fail that are against your kingdom and that are against your righteousness and that are against the word of God. In the name of Jesus, we pray against the new forms of morality that are inconsistent with the word of God. We ask you, O oh God, help us to be your vessels, your voices, and help us to have victory as we go forth in the name of Jesus, whose name is above every name, not just in America, but above every name that's in the earth or the heaven rim. I give you thanks. Amen. Well, I'm having a great time. As you can see, I was back home and somebody said, uh, one of my young uh, with Tumpkins said to me, uh, yes, I'm listening to you on the radio or on Facebook. Good morning. And she said, good morning. And it's a beautiful day outside. And we all just burst into laughter. I hope today that you'll burst into laughter because God is good to you. God loves us. I'm so assured of that. I walk in that confident assurance. No matter what kind of adversities I have faced, I walk in the assurance that my Heavenly Father watches over me. I walk in the assurance that no weapon formed against me will prosper. And any word uttered against me is condemned already by God and will not stand against me at the judgment. I walk in the assurance, greater is he that is within me than he that's in the world. I walk in the assurance. I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. That is, I can go through great adversity and come out triumphant. I walk in that assurance because Jesus has made himself known to me in such a way I cannot doubt him. That was an old song back in uh, the day. We don't sing it too much now that says I'm satisfied with Jesus. My late aunt, uh, the late Mrs. Jetty Pearl George, Jetty Pearl Schufert George, and my late mom, uh, Reverend Cora Rebecca Crenshaw Schufert, used to lead that song in the prayer meetings. <laughs> every every uh, weekend when I would come home from seminary, two and a half years, the old ladies and one or two of the old men, they'd get together, they had the prayer meeting, the prayer band. They called the prayer band. The late evangelist Sarah Nell Marshall and uh, the late evangelist Cooper and, and I don't, can't remember all the people who were in there. Uh, the evangelist Marshall's mother, uh, whose name I can't remember right now, uh, but whose face I see. And they would testify and they would sing and they would pray. Because they had assurance that God was with them. You can have that same assurance and even greater. Because God is still God and he wants to walk with you and to be in you. I'll be back at 6 o'clock. I'm going to be talking uh, from the book of Luke and I'm going to be talking about I'm, a, I'm continuing uh, what this Romans, but I'm going to be in the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to talk about justification. And you're going to be uh, enlightened, and you're going to receive great information from the Word of God as to just how justified uh, and how justification works and how justified you are already in Christ Jesus. Until then, Claude Schufert, Mount Zion, right here on West Jeff Davis Avenue in Montgomery, Alabama. We say have a good rest of your day. We'll see you at 6 o'clock. Bye-bye.